Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The focus of our meditation this evening is the burial of Christ our Lord. You will see that we do not follow through on our good intentions, but that the Savior does of his, even embracing sinners like you and me to do so. Again from the Passion, then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. So far the text, let us pray. O Lamb of God, bless thy word, that we may trust in thee. Amen. There's no doubt you have a long list of friends eager to help. But friends who actually show up to help, they can be far and few between. They might be quick to agree with you, promise to support you. But when push comes to shove, it is often turned out to be all talk leaving you to take a stand alone, wondering where everyone else is. That's why when an important task sits before you, you've got to take the lead yourself. Waiting around for everyone else to show up is the best way to make sure it does not get done. Or if they do come to your aid, like a child who knows just the right time to show up and dry the last two dishes, help with the last five minutes of a chore, that eager friend lends their helping finger at the very end, or boasts what a great job you did well after the fact. All too little, too late. In our passion narrative this evening, we find a case of this too little, too late in Nicodemus the Pharisee and Joseph of Arimathea. For it's only after our Lord has given up the ghost that these two show up. Now it's nice indeed they do, as they do play a kind and caring final role but it must be asked, where have they been? Well, Nicodemus had shown up three years prior at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry saying, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. But Nicodemus came to Jesus pledging his support, endorsing his ministry at night, in secret, lest the other Pharisees caught wind of his interest in the preacher they so despised. We do see Nicodemus speak up not long thereafter, when early on Jesus exposes their hypocrisy of trusting in the law to save, and many begin to confess him as the long-promised prophet. The Pharisees begin grumbling about how they'd like to do away with this Jesus. Nicodemus objects. Doth our law judge any man before it hear him, and know what he doeth? Shouldn't we at least hear him out? at which point he is summarily bullied. What? Art thou also of Galilee? Intimidating poor Nicodemus into silence. Silent Nicodemus remained. As a ruler of the Jews, there's no way he would have been clueless of the plot against Jesus the night in which he was betrayed. And scripture records no attempt 
to stop it. No words of objection. Not much of a friend after all. The same goes for Joseph of Arimathea. Although he himself waited for the kingdom of God, he too was Jesus' disciple secretly for the fear of the Jews. Scripture details that Joseph consented not to their plan, but although he objected, he played no veto card. How vocal could his objection have been? Yes, here at the end, they purchase fine linen. They go boldly unto Pilate, begging for his body, desperate to show this their secret savior, at least some dignity. But one must ask, is this not too little, too late? You would think, way too late. Jesus is dead. Ah, these two friends, so bold, so supportive. They might remind you of a few of your own. Remind you of the times you've been left to fend for yourself, been made to look like a fool, when you've been told you're right, but no one comes to your defense. Friends who have kept their support a secret, showing up so boldly, only too little too late. To be more accurate though, when we look at these two, Nicodemus and Joseph, we see ourselves. For you know all too personally what it's like to know the right thing to say, but keep silent. The right thing to do, but do nothing. Object it first, but go along with the crowd. Yes, God offers here a glimpse into the soul of every sinner. But his word does not leave such self-reflection on our lack of follow-through to mere glimpses. James speaks to the soul explicitly. Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. And the Lord Jesus himself, whoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Reflect on the times you've let down friends, family, your God. And you'll come to find your efforts in his name to be too little too late yourself. This, dear Christians, is the case with us all. Which is why your Savior, he waited around for no one. If you think you've learned that helpfulness is so often all talk, if you've been burned by those who haven't followed through for you, Jesus, who searches the heart, he knows perfectly what our end would be if he waited on our help, our part. Herein, then, is the very heart of the good news to be found in his name. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. The mystery of this, the saving love of your God, is that our inaction drove his action. 
our inability to solve our problem drove his resolve to save. That's why you see in his passion, not just of these last two, but of all his friends, that the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. In three disciples so eager to be part of the select few with him in the garden, but who fall asleep. Peter, who claimed, though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee, but does so, denies him, mere hours later, under absolutely no threat to his life. And the crowd, who had beheld so many miracles, had had such high hopes, all that subsiding into the shouts of, crucify him. None of this stopped Jesus. Waiting around for any of them, for any of us, was the best way to make sure it did not get done. With such an important task before him as the world's redemption, he willingly submitted himself to it all. To the shame and scorn of a bitter loneliness forsaken by his friends, and to the far deeper anguish forsaken by his Father. For what the Son of God suffered in our place was the hell you and I deserved as he made atonement for each of our sins, all of which left him beaten and marred, lifeless and limp, on a cross. At which point, only after the fact, two friends do decide to show up and help to bury him with dignity. Too little, too late, so it might appear to the human eye. But the scriptures reveal in these two, as in all things, your God at work. For Joseph and Nicodemus venture out of their secretness at just the right time, God's time, to bring about the fulfillment of prophecy. You see, there's a funny detail in Isaiah's prophecy of Christ's death and burial, two contradictory details which, which don't add up. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. The striking juxtaposition or contrast that the Messiah would die the vulgar death of a vile criminal, criminal, but then be laid to rest in a wealthy man's tomb. The bodies of other criminals taken from a cross were disposed of in the most unsavory of fashions. No other victim of crucifixion had been given a burial fit for a king a clean new sepulchre in which no man had ever been laid. As a detail which would never have come together, matched up, lest God had Joseph and Nicodemus come to the fore. Perhaps outwardly, they came to save his body from one last disgrace, but really in God's plan, to make all things happen according to his peculiar design. By this final detail, and every other detail of prophecy fulfilled in Christ's suffering and death, giving you the confidence of the most extraordinary detail, its meaning and power, the forgiveness of all of your sins, 
and full reconciliation with your God. For the Jesus who died with the wicked, but rested with the rich, rose again the third day, just as those scriptures also said he would do. Dear Christians, the story of Joseph and Nicodemus might on the surface appear to be a case of too little, too late. But the gospel of Jesus' death and resurrection reveals God's power to use all things for his eternal purposes. That Christ embraces sinners like you and me who cannot be trusted to follow through into his kingdom by grace nonetheless to accomplish his amazing purpose. So when you find you have not done or said what you know is right, when your effort has been admittedly too little too late, confess it as the sin it is, and behold the Lord of grace who waits around for no one to make his salvation known. For although we have all denied him in our own ways, the good news is that Jesus also says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. Embrace the times you do confess him, like tonight, as the Spirit's faithful work in your heart. For the same Spirit of God, which drew Nicodemus and Joseph out of their secretness to stand boldly before Pilate and carry the Savior's body in their arms for all to see, that same Spirit has gathered you out of your secret places to publicly confess his name to, all in God's perfect time. May his spirit continue to flourish among us, to confess him in humility to one another, and to receive those who do come to your aid, even if a bit late, as sent by your Lord in his right time. A perspective and insight which can only flow from faith in the cross and empty tomb. Now, if we so easily lose confidence in other people, there should be no surprise you'll have your times you feel the same toward your God. Where in the midst of life's pain and sorrows, you wonder where he has been, whether his promises to you are all talk like the rest of your friends? Dear Christians, look to Christ's passion and behold a love which never diminishes, a Savior who waits on no one to give you everything. And you'll find that when you doubt his perfect care, You've simply been looking in the wrong place. For your God has indeed come to your help, your help in every need, at the perfect time and in the perfect way on his cross. To shower upon you a boundless grace, never too little, and a redemption not too late, but eternal. Now the peace that passeth all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.